Secretary of State Antony Blinken wrapped up his two day trip to Pittsburgh with a meeting with local labor leaders this afternoon. Then in an exclusive interview, the secretary sat down with political editor John Delato. Well, Secretary Blinken, thank you so much for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. Great to be with you, John. So let me just ask you, you could have chosen any city mm -hmm. in America, maybe even in Europe for this first ever U.S. European Trade and Technology Council meeting. Why did you choose Pittsburgh? It was done very deliberately because, and we've seen it in the couple of days that we've been here, you have in, in Pittsburgh a city that was obviously the manufacturing capital of the, the country in the 20th century. It's now the technological uh, center uh, of, the, uh, of the country in, in this century, but it also has so many of the different stakeholders represented, including uh, the labor movement, where I just, uh, just spent a, a couple of hours. Um, and all of this together is so important in how we think about dealing with the issues of trade and technology that are having a real impact uh, on our people's lives. And what's happening here in this city, I think, uh, in many ways shows the way uh, through some of these issues, issues that we have to work on with our European partners. What have you learned by being here in Pittsburgh on this trip? Well, I've learned a, a, a lot of things. One is that, uh, as I said, it just reinforced for me the fact that when it comes from everything to cutting edge uh, medical research, including on, on COVID-19, uh, when it comes to the work that's being done on, on driverless cars, but when it also comes to having a, a, a strong and growing stronger uh, labor movement that is so essential uh, to, uh, to the future uh, of our country and our economy, it's all, it's all here in Pittsburgh. And one of the things that's so challenging that we have to uh, deal with is making these transitions from the economy of, uh, of, of, of the past to the economy of the future, but making sure that as we're making those transitions, uh, people don't get left behind, that they come along. And that's what's happening every day uh, in this city, and I think for both uh, us and the government and also for our European partners, uh, there's a lot to be learned. Let me ask this question. It's really from a local perspective. You are the top foreign policy expert, leader of this country, other than the president, of course. And there's a lot of concern about supply issues mm -hmm. and about competition from China. That's right. How important is that to you? When it impacts local people, we can't get supply parts here in Pittsburgh for mm -hmm. some of our manufacturing companies. What can you do at the State Department to make sure perhaps that we reinvigorate mm -hmm. American business, American manufacturing, mm -hmm. so we don't have to rely on China, yeah. who we know cheat. So there's a lot that goes into that, John, and it's one of the things that we talked about. One of the things we've learned, uh, including from the COVID-19 crisis, is we have to build uh, more diversified and more resilient supply chains, including uh, bringing some of that manufacturing uh, and supply uh, back here to the United States, especially when it comes to critical products or critical technologies where we can't afford uh, to be dependent uh, on anyone else or we can't afford to have a shortage in a crunch. But in some cases, it also means making sure that some of that uh, supply is coming from our closest partners and allies like uh, the European allies and partners. So that's exactly uh, what we talked about. But it's also a reminder of how important uh, human capital is in all of this because uh, at the end of the day, we're so much is being driven by, by new technologies, and that's important. And we, there, there is a tremendous uh, job potential in those new technologies. Hey, you've but seen some of them right I, here in Pittsburgh, saw, Argo. I, I went to see Argo, uh, among other things. But at the same time, uh, we can't lose sight of um, the fact that at the heart of everything still uh, is, uh, is, the, is the human resource here. You've got a, supply, a, a critical supply chain during, during COVID, uh, the food supply chain. Well. If workers have um, an unsafe work environment, uh, if they're going into a processing plant uh, or they're, uh, they're driving the trucks or they're stocking the grocery shelves and, and that's not safe, they fa face a terrible choice between giving up their, uh, their job and their livelihood or working in an unsafe place. The supply chain may get disrupted, so we have to pay attention to that too, even as we're working uh, with our partners and allies to build stronger supply chains uh, here and uh, in close countries. As you know, there's been uh, these congressional hearings this week in Washington over Afghanistan and, and the actions there. From a local perspective, mm. when we view this from outside of the Beltway, mm. it seems to me there's an awful lot of finger pointing 
between the State Department and the Pentagon. And as you may know, in an executive session, General Milley essentially told congressional uh, leaders that the State Department waited too long to order an evacuation in Kabul. Is that true? And what do you make of all this? I guess I'd say, John, look, this was, first of all, uh, the president's decision to end the longest war uh, in our history uh, was the right decision. The decision not to send a third generation of Americans back to Afghanistan to fight and die there uh, was the right decision. And at the end of the day, we had what was an extraordinary uh, evacuation mission where we got 125,000 people uh, out of Afghanistan. That has never been done before. Um, I think as uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley, uh, himself has said, no one uh, anticipated that the government in Afghanistan uh, and the security forces would collapse as quickly as they did. And I think, you know, for anyone to say that uh, uh, any of these decisions were made by any one uh, agency, that's, that's not how we work. We do, these, we do, we do all of this together. Uh, the President brings everyone together. Uh, everyone is heard. Uh, everyone is listened to when we make these decisions collectively. That's what happened in Afghanistan. We're running down on time, but I'm going to ask you two quick questions. One, another one that relates here locally, I think it relates all over the, the, the country, has to do with ransomware mm. and security and Russia. Mm. What are you doing to protect Americans from ransoms that really can disrupt individuals as well as companies? Yeah, you're, no, you're, you're exactly right. We're seeing this have, having an increasing impact uh, across the country uh, and indeed around the world. So it's very straightforward. There are a few things that we're doing and that need to happen. One is we need to make sure that uh, there are better, better defenses in place, that uh, people are aware of the problem, that they're putting in place uh, the necessary protections to, uh, to guard against it. And it's, everything is as basic as making sure you're updating software on a very regular basis to uh, other protections. But we also have to go on the offensive and disrupt and dismantle these cr mostly criminal organizations that are engaged in ransomware. And if, a, if any country, whether it's Russia or any other country, is harboring uh, such groups, it has a responsibility uh, to deal with them, to take them down, to dismantle them, to prosecute them. Uh, and if uh, they're unwilling or unable to do that, uh, there are actions that President Biden has made clear uh, to President Putin, among others, that we will take to do it. Well, Mr. Secretary, thank you, sir, very much for your time today. I really appreciate Thanks. it. Great to be with you, John. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.